Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, before I start, maybe I introduce myself a little bit. Um, my name is Henk Bruders. Um, I am not Canadian. I'm Dutch, actually. Uh, I've been with McKinsey for 18 years now, serving mostly bank and insurance companies. And I actually moved to the Toronto office in, uh, in uh, about six months ago. So uh, I'm based in Canada, but only recently. So what I'm going to share with you today is going to be more like a global view than a Canadian view. Um, in my role serving banks and insurance companies, the last couple of years have been mostly about digital and agile, agile software development, we feel is a very important um, uh, building block of that, uh, which is why I'm standing here, I guess, in front of you talking about agile. And I'm looking forward to sharing my ideas for the next 45 minutes or so. So change is coming faster to us um, ever today in an increasingly digital world, right? Uh, companies of all sizes are developing software uh, to help them compete, but good software is really hard to build. It often takes too long, uh, costs too much or fails, and doesn't perform as expected. And that's where Agile comes in. Agile software development emphasizes tight collaboration between developers and uh, customers, rapid prototyping, and continuous testing and review. Done well, it really boosts um, software quality, quality, developer productivity, and team morale, and it reduces risk. Um, done poorly, it can actually destroy value. Agile development at scale is especially hard because it requires new processes, uh, new governance models, capabilities, and mindsets. And um, all of these are very difficult for most big organizations. So with that introduction, let's see who we have in the room today, okay? Now, I didn't opt in to do this uh, electronic polling because I'd like to see people when they vote. <laughs> so everyone who has heard of Agile, please stand up. That's great. That's great. So if you have not begun, so please, please keep standing. Please keep standing. So everyone who has heard of Agile. So that's, I would say, the majority. Okay. So if you have not begun your Agile journey yet in your organization, please sit down. All right. Now, if you have not completed your Agile journey yet in your company, please sit down. All right. So basically, many of, many of you are in the middle of it, and some of them have completed. And these are, I guess, the experts. I'm going to remember you, because if I get difficult questions, I'll <laughs> hand them over to you. Um, so now we know how many people have completed an Agile transformation. Um, um, so, as I said, we're going to have some questions later. But before we get to those questions, let's talk about two powerful global trends uh, that are threatening leading companies in a wide range of industries. Sharp increases in customer expectations and the growing power of startups. Let's first focus on customer expectations, uh, and we differentiate four dimensions. Firstly, the millennial, millennial mindset. Uh, of digitally native, highly financially literate consumers. It's becoming very predominant. Secondly, customers increasingly look for simple, convenient experiences that seamlessly cross uh, channels and that are secure and private. Thirdly, customers are looking for personalized offerings and want to reward it, be rewarded for loyalty. And finally, they don't want to pay too much. Actually, they like things for free. In other words, customers these days are putting a lot of pressure on revenue and profits alike. Given these consumer demands and how slowly most incumbents are responding to meet those demands, unprecedented amounts of money are now flowing into fintech. I think it was last year more than $12 billion, US dollars. Um, and that was three times more than the year before. And the costs of launching a startup have fallen significantly. And startups aren't burdened by legacy systems or processes. And what's more, and this is turning out um, to be incredibly important, startups attract more digital talent. Today's software and big data hotshots don't want to work for salaries in big companies. They actually want to be char in charge of something cool and make millions before they're 30. Also, incumbents in the payments industry are facing some big challenges right now. Um, we studied actually about 1,000 startups fintechs, actually, 
so financial institutions, startups, and we put them in a database. And funnily enough, the database is called Panorama. It has nothing to do with this conference, but it's called FinTech Panorama. And let me show you how that looks like. So what we did is um, we categorized these startups into four um, high-level products and capabilities, or value proposition, if you will, account management, lending, financing, payments, and financial assets and capital markets, so investments. And we categorized them into a large corporate, commercial, or retail. And of course, it's not a surprise to see that most of the startups, 22% of the startups in our database, um, actually, sorry, 40% in our database is in payments, and a little bit more than half of that is in the, uh, is in the retail space. Not surprising, I'm sure, not to all of you. Um, what is surprising is that if you look at the slice of revenue, of banking revenue in payments is relatively small, as, as I'm sure you're aware. The, the bigger revenues streams are in lending. Uh, this is categorized with the colors. So the gray colors are uh, categories or segments where banking revenue is more than 75 or 10%. Now, the last year or so, last 6 to 12 months, we see more and more startups in the lending space um, and less in the payment space. So it, looks li it, it seems like... Um, Startups are uh, moving a little bit more in the direction of, um, of lending and the bigger, bigger pockets of banks. Now, some of the innovators in the payment space are likely to make some substantial share gains while they drive down, um, while they drive down uh, prices. And uh, we did an analysis to see what the effect of that was, would be. So I'll spare you the details of this analysis, but basically we, we took all, every p &L item of the global payments industry and uh, try, to, uh, try to figure out what the effect of all the P&L items are. This is just at the revenue level. Um, but basically the analysis uh, of the effect of fintechs, of disruption, digital disruption in general, on the global payment industry um, is in this graph. And we believe that over the next 10 years, innovation, we expect innovation to reduce the industry profit, uh, sorry, the industry revenue to reduce by more than 200 billion, or about 30%, mostly due to price erosion. And incumbents who can't move fast enough will fall behind. The good news is that most of your competitors may fall in that category. Um, if you can move faster, you'll be more likely to outperform them and keep pace with attackers. Now let's do a quick poll. Um, again, not on the, on, the, on the smartphones. So if you think innovation will have a smaller effect than this 30%. Please raise your hand. Nobody thinks that. So if you think 30% estimate is about right, please raise your hand. One, two, three, a couple of people. And who think that innovators will have an even bigger impact? That's the majority. Wow, that's surprising. Uh, that's very interesting, actually. Actually, I always try to image or visualize for myself how this would have looked if I would have been talking to a, you know, a room full of taxi companies about four or five years ago, just before Uber really hit the markets. Um, I think you are ahead of that, because I'm sure those taxi companies would not have said it would be more than 30%. Of course, in reality, it is. So it's great to see that you guys have a, a higher level of awareness than those taxi companies, I suppose. So one thing we know for sure is that traditional approaches to application development and digital transformation aren't fast enough or effective enough in today's competitive world. As you can see, one of our surveys um, shows that companies that use traditional approaches often fail to keep, keep pace with executives or customers, timelines. And they tend to use only about one in five of new features they develop. In other words, more transformations, efforts, are simply a waste of time and money. Now, traditional approaches, or sometimes referred to as waterfall approaches, they have major shortcomings. Waterfall is basically a process, I'm sure most of you are aware of that, where you start gathering specifications. This is overly, overly simplified, of course. You then design, you then build, you then test, you then produce. And the advantage of that is that it is um, clearly defined stages, and that helps with planning and scheduling, of course. And it's also easy to divide and conquer, to give roles and responsibilities for different parts of the development process. But some of the downsides include uh, there's a large separation between business and R&D and development. Uh, it does require users to know all the way up front what they need. And in a 
time where things change a lot, it happens a lot that by the time it's in production, it's not what you want anymore. Um, there's a long time to market typically, and there's a lot of rework in this, uh, in this process, and that typically drives up the costs a lot. Now, Agile is a different approach that helps organizations address these shortcomings. In Agile, cross-functional teams work in short sprints. They learn as they go. They have crystal clear goals with the end products in mind, and they constantly test prototypes with users to confirm the value of what they're building. In other words, they work more like startups. That's how they make advances in multiple um, areas simultaneously. Some of the advantages include it's more flexible, adaptable, it's typically cheaper, it's dramatically faster, it's aligned with the business, less risk, improved accountability. A downside is it can be more complex to manage, of course. Agile works in all kinds of industries. New Metrics, which is a, a, a software project productivity benchmark company that, uh, that McKinsey owns, um, analyzed more than 1,300 software projects, um, agile and non-agile projects, of different sizes, different industries, using different programming languages. What we found was impressive. When we compared the cost, schedule compliance, and quality performance, of the 500 or so projects that used Agile methods with those that used waterfall methodology, which is the left-hand side, um, we found that Agile projects were about 27% on average more productive. We also found that they had about 30% less schedule slip and less than a third of the residual defects at launch. And in defiance of the adage that you can't have it better, faster, and cheaper, Actually, we found that the development costs were about 40% lower. So Agile can be great. And about a quarter of our banking clients um, are now experimenting with Agile. They're seeing limited impact so far, but they're learning. Um, more than half of them are making some progress. I think that kind of resonates with our little poll in the beginning. Um, using Agile in 10 to 30% of their projects. Um, they're seeing some incremental impact, but also some substantial friction uh, with enterprise processes like sourcing, budgeting, uh, staffing, etc. Only very few banks are what we would call Agile at scale, where the majority of projects is done in an Agile way. Um, by the way, not 100%, but a majority, 30, 40, 50, 5, 60%. Um, only very few banks are what we call at this level, at this agile at scale level, where the majority is done in an agile way. This is still the domain, mostly um, technology companies and, and some greenfield um, startups, of course, are in. Now, what I take from these findings is that those of you who can move quickly in the right direction will develop a real competitive advantage. That might sound straightforward, but here's the challenge. Agile can be very hard to scale, particularly in big organizations, like I'm sure most of you are coming from. There are many reasons uh, traditional companies have trouble scaling up their agile programs, um, but a chief impediment is, um, is uh, or actually are their operating models and organizational structures. Um, in most of these large companies, software and product development are fragmented and complex. For example, building a new website feature can kickstart a development process involving multiple teams, each tackling a series of tasks that feed into the original request. Um, one team, for example, might work on um, front-end applications, another on associated servers and databases, another reconciling the front-end application with legacy back-end systems, etc. What's more, the supporting processes like budgeting, planning, outsourcing, uh, and existing roles and responsibilities in the IT organization and business units typically continue to stick with legacy waterfall uh, approach. So for most companies, it's difficult to incorporate agile practices from small scale pilots into business units, into all business units and functions, regardless of the success of those pilots. Those um, 
uh, of those pilots without make it, making some real structural changes. The challenges may be many. Let's talk about some of the biggest ones. First, there's a certain art to agile. It needs to meet each company's specific needs. Those who try to adopt agile by the book often fail. Secondly, the momentum has to come from the top. We sometimes see top management um, and the businesses lose interest after the initial excitement about agile, often because they don't understand uh, the plans or progress reports. But agile isn't the flavor of the month. It has to become part of the organizational DNA. Thirdly, the support from senior leaders has to include consistent change management, governance and metrics. Um, probably some of our experienced colleagues here in the room can testify this. Uh, many companies that rely on grassroots efforts alone find agile never reaches critical mass. Fourthly, agile also requires technical skills, of course, like robust engineering practices, testing and automation, build and deploy processes, environment management, etc. Fifthly, success also requires the right infrastructure. Continuous integration and effective testing allow teams to make short iterations and deliver working code at the end of each iteration. And the sixth uh, major requirement is making agile and non-agile systems interact. Uh, if non-agile systems um, and processes get in the way, they can cause significant delays. So that's a lot to think about. The move to Agile is complicated and usually produces some failures. We did a, we did a poll of some of, uh, I think about 25 companies that had implemented Agile and asked them how perfect it was. And in about 85% of the respondents, they said it wasn't perfect. There were some failures. Doesn't mean that these projects were uh, a big disaster or there were no um, improvements achieved, but there were, uh, there were issues with it. Um, and it's, of course, interesting to see what those issues are or were. This is what they said. So lack of experience with Agile was the first uh, thing they mentioned. Secondly, the company philosophy at odds with core Agile values, lack of management support, typically senior management support, uh, pressure to follow waterfall methodology, lack of cultural transition, broader organizational issues, and unwillingness to follow Agile methodology. And as you can see, our research shows that four out of the top six uh, of these challenges are basically rooted in the operating model. So while there are big rewards for companies that can harness agile development, there are big challenges in getting there, especially on adapting the operating model and especially for large companies. And we are helping big companies uh, use agile in, in, in nearly every industry. The changes they make to their operating models uh, and we helped them with that, um, basically falls in four basic categories. The first one is organizational structure. So traditional companies tend to organize IT resources according to applications and projects, creating fragmented uh, development experiences we've been talking about. Instead, they need to organize IT resources around products. That means gathering business unit leaders, developers, and other members of the organization in stable teams who focus on delivering clear business outcomes from beginning to end. This means the end of projects as they are traditionally defined and of coordinating bodies such as project offices. In an agile at scale environment, products may actually be combinations of offerings such as a payroll service, for example, or um, or the customer experience, uh, such as all the features and tasks that make up a customer onboarding journey. So it's important for business and IT leaders to redefine the units of delivery. And once products have been recategorized, the company, oh, the company uh, designates an agile team or clusters of agile teams who are responsible for the development and maintenance tasks associated with those products. These teams typically include developers, testers, uh, product owners, and others. They can draw support from experts, such as specialists in security uh, issues, user experience researchers, or enterprise IT architects. To give you an example, one of our clients um, switched from a project to a product-oriented um, operating model. 
it deploys now talent and IT resources based on requirements for the entire customer onboarding journey, for example, um, rather than according to the individual applications used during onboarding. With this new focus, um, the company now launches up to four website features every month instead of four every year. Um, and teams experiment with, experiment with minimally viable products, um, test and learn from those prototypes, and deliver new features in days or weeks rather than years. Using Agile at scale also requires changing the relationship between the business and IT. To create an Agile at scale environment, companies break down silos uh, between and within business units and IT. They typically name strong product owners from the business units to work with IT, people who understand the company's products well and who have the technical knowledge and authority to prioritize feature changes in products. In most traditional companies, product owners from the business side are involved in software development, only sporadically providing input as needed. And uh, to compensate for that lack of engagement, IT organizations often appoint a proxy product owner from IT. But a proxy product owner from IT typically has limited access to customers and no mandate to make real decisions. Teams therefore lack direction, priorities and accountability, and that stalls the development and leads to rework and waste. By contrast, a strong product owner can make decisions quickly, reducing bottlenecks and increase productivity. Projects are managed by the business with navigational help from IT at every stage. In other words, the projects aim to deliver innovation that actually works in the marketplace. Advances that meet customers most urgent needs, for example, rather than something simply meeting technical needs. Third, teams will look more like startups. About half the companies we studied have redefined managers' roles and responsibilities to account for the distinct capabilities associated with agile versus waterfall development. Consider the differences. The project manager using a waterfall approach typically coordinates a range of tasks across application development teams, database teams, and so on. Under an agile approach, the number of tasks and therefore the need for coordination is minimized. Uh, the tasks that remain are handled by a strong product owner or the Agile team itself. Our clients who are succeeding with Agile at scale are committed to transparency. They provide clear guidelines about which decisions should be made within the team and which require external input. They define these boundaries clearly, uh, giving team members enough power to make decisions, but not so much, of course, that they could take unreasonable risks. And the budgeting approach changes. Again, along the lines of a startup, most IT organizations adhere to annual budgeting and planning cycles, which can involve painful rebalancing across an entire portfolio of technology initiatives, along with rework and waste. Companies using Agile still make annual budgets, of course, but they revisit roadmaps and plans quarterly or sometimes even monthly, uh, and they reprioritize projects continually. So that's an overview of what's required. Let's talk a little bit more about the upside and the risks. Um, as, we've, as, as I've shown earlier, um, the research showed that an average agile program is more than 25%, 27% more productive than waterfall. That's a big deal, but, but who, who, who wants to be average? So we looked at the top quartile of companies and that shows that if you do it well, if you're in the top quartile, the productivity, productivity boost is, is incredible. It's almost two times more. Um, they're almost twice as productive as their non-agile competitors. But there's also, a, there, there's also an, the other side of the coin here. Uh, companies uh, that get agile wrong are much less productive. They're much, not just much less productive, of course, than the average of agile projects. They're much less productive than waterfall. And I'd just like, like you to think about that. I mean, there is, a, there, there is a way to get this wrong and therefore end up with a lower product, productive, productive software applica application development um, department. 
Um, those in the bottom quartile, as I said, they can be 30% less productive than traditional approaches. And of course, that doesn't actually improve the career prospects of agile proponents. So Numetrix, uh, so it's a long story, but Numetrix uh, measures that through uh, function points and story points, I think. It's a combination of both. Okay. That's the short version. And did this, when you said productivity improvement or impact, was it measuring a person or its own performance? Like, what was the control for this, for this improvement? Uh, I think it was against the original uh, estimate estimates of how many function points or story points a certain project would be. And then it was measured against, uh, against that, if that makes sense. So let me end with a couple of words about what success looks like. A couple of banks are making great advances with Agile. For example, in Argentina, BBVA worked hard to give all of its business leaders a strong knowledge of digital, um, since they are now on the same page. They work better across functions and units. The bank now gets products to market in weeks instead of months. Commonwealth Bank of Australia created organizational, an organizational infrastructure that's so clear and consistent that about 50 agile teams, 5-0, can work in parallel. They devoted about a fifth of their developers to improving customer service. All moved from number four to number one in their ranking. More recently, Commonwealth was also ranked number two in, on the list of Australia's most innovative countries, uh, most innovative companies. And it's of course great to have a plaque on the wall, uh, but what this award really means is that now the company can attract much more development and digital talent. And that's a big deal for them. ING um, went beyond Agile and used the DevOps approach to integrate software development and IT operations. They improved time to market by about 37% and cut application costs by about 60%. And Itaú, uh, as a Brazilian bank, uh, developed a clear digital roadmap and created a two-speed IT architecture to increase mobile and internet channel transactions by about 34% and remote transactions by about 40%. And a US bank introduced lean management to link the front line to senior business leaders. And they customized Agile methodology for each project type. They cut run rate costs by about 25%, improved time to market by about 30%, and now do more than half of all development using Agile. And these are just a couple of examples, of course. But Agile is an incredibly valuable approach that is delivering benefits around the world for banks and their customers and their shareholders. And the banks, or the, the companies we've studied, uh, actually use three basic approaches to changing their op operating models around Agile. So the one extreme is what we call the lab approach. Um, there, a company sets up a, uh, an Agile operating model apart from the rest of the organization. They, they sort of ring fence it um, to serve as a testing ground, and, um, and they do that before rolling out capabilities and processes to the entire IT organization. We believe that this approach, this lab approach, um, makes sense when the company has only limited support from senior management for larger changes and needs to approve the business case quickly. It's like a proof of concept. For the most part, however, the separate organizations created in a lab approach tend to remain separate rather than influencing change across the organization. So that's the downside of it. It's difficult to scale it up from a small pilot. On the other side, the other extreme is, and this is only a handful of companies, they've experimented with what we call a big bang redesign they basically, they move all functions and all business units towards a new organizational structure and new roles, self-contained agile cells and faster processes all in one go. For this to work, senior leadership, senior management really has to be all in from day one and that's something that rarely happens. And somewhere in the middle is what we call a wave and spike approach. Individual teams are reconfigured as agile teams in waves while elements of the new operating model, like the budgeting, for example, or roles and responsibilities, are deployed more in spikes. And as each successive wave of teams is indoctrinated to Agile, the company then collects feedback and develops and re revises training materials for the next set of teams. That's the way they roll that out. 
So, concluding, summarizing, I try to convey basically four key messages. Um, first of all, customer expectations and fintech companies are forcing banks to innovate much faster and much more efficient. Traditional application uh, development approaches are falling short. Banks will have to adopt Agile, Agile's way of working. Many banks have started already on this journey and are meeting many challenges. Many of them are operating model related. And when Agile is implemented in the right way, it can almost double the productivity of application development. So that was a quick overview of a very complex topic. Thank you very much for your attention. I think we have some time for questions left. So maybe we do that. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So the question is, give some color um, to um, some of our clients who went through this journey, especially in the first couple of. Maybe, yeah, maybe give them an idea of, like, for example, like, sure. Yeah. So a bank I served uh, where we helped implement Agile. Uh, this was in Europe. Um, we um, uh, it's basically what we helped them with is. Um, put together a couple of agile teams on two or three journeys, customer journeys. And, 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 but that was very much ring-fenced, a little bit, as I said, in this, in this first uh, uh, approach, um, uh, more a lab scale. We call it actually also the digital lab. And um, um, after 15, 16 weeks, they delivered, you know, they had many sprints, and after 16 weeks, they had their first minimal viable product, and then they went on the next wave, et cetera. Very quickly in that process, um, although the team didn't just consist, of course, of IT people, it had business people, a product owner, it had legal people, compliance people, it was all uh, available. Um, still, the, the, very quickly, the team hit a couple of the operating model um, challenges, as I described. For example, um, although this was an agile team, the bank insisted having a steering committee. And a steering committee is a, is, is a word you shouldn't use in Agile because it very much relates to an old way of, of working. Nevertheless, all these people that were in the team had bosses and those bosses wanted to be involved. So we had to create some kind of a steering committee. That steering committee uh, was planning to, um, to meet every three, four weeks. And we said, that's not possible. This steering committee has to be there within, has to be able to make a decision in 24 hours. Now, that was a big discussion and, and a long discussion, but, but it, it, and, and it took a lot of effort, but eventually we got them so far that the steering committee was on call within 24 hours, no paper, we just brought them into the agile room basically where we had you know, the whole process on the walls basically. And then people of the agile team would demonstrate to the steering committee and say, we really need to develop this API or we need to, we need to help with this. Um, and then they would make a decision. Very different, very uncomfortable for most of the, the managers in that steering committee. But it's, that's, uh, that gives maybe a little bit of flavor of the kind of roadblocks the team was, was, was hitting. Budgeting was the same thing. You know? there, was a, there was some money budgeted for this, agile, for this first Agile team, and then they needed more. How do you do that? You know? uh, it was only because there was a couple of senior people, the head of application development and the head of the regional bank in this case, the two of them. Actually, the head of the retail bank had been the CIO before which is very interesting. I don't think there's many banks where a CIO moves from CIO to becoming the head of the retail bank, but in this case it happened. Um, so the CIO and the head of, uh, sorry, the head of retail bank and the head of application development together thought this was a road, and they made, they basically uh, paved the road for this team. Without them, this would have never been possible, I, would, would I argue. Does that answer your question to some extent? Yeah, All right. any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I think works best, if this is a if the team, the agile team, tries to solve a business issue, not an IT issue, but a business issue, and as a result, um, for example, improving the customer experience of a certain customer journey, that's a business problem. It's not an IT problem. It's a business problem, and the owner of that problem is typically a, a product owner or or a journey owner. So some companies have organized themselves towards journeys, like onboarding, for example, uh, of any product. 
and uh, and then it would that be would be that person that would be the that will be the leader. Now there's there's different levels, of course. So first of all, the, the, these are the teams, and I think it would be, as I said, it should be led by a product owner, or a customer experience or journey owner. Then there is the level of the program itself, because agile is not just one or two or three teams. Eventually, this needs to become the new way of working. So there needs to be some ownership uh, for the program of Agile. And that typically starts in IT, because that's the first part where, um, where this is typically deployed. But then very quickly, it's going to hit the business. So what we see a lot in many banks is that this is the, the programs. I'm not talking about the teams, but the program at a higher level is owned by the, the CIO or the head of application development, some, a senior person in the IT organization. And then there's always this inflection point where, um, where you hit all these, these organizational and operating model roadblocks. And that's typically a point where the ownership of Agile then moves over to the business side. Usually innovation, head of innovation or something like that. But more business than IT. So, um, so let me try and answer that question with an example of, of a client where we were called in. Um, they had implemented Agile, they had Agile teams, but those teams had somehow, um, 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 the, the teams thought they were now sort of self-steering. In other words, they could do whatever they like. They all felt we're sitting in a garage, sort of, and we do what we like. And there was no performance pressure. Um, and uh, they, you know, they, they read uh, literature and they, th they saw Spotify implementing tribes and, and, and gangs and what have you more. And, and they tried to copy that without thinking about the implications. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm slightly older, so I still know the days where we had st self-steering teams in the 90s. Somebody remembers that. And that was the same issue. Self-steering teams don't work if you don't give them um, targets. And, 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 and a mandate, on one hand a mandate, a freedom, but at the same time a target. Uh, you cannot just let them loose in some space and, uh, and develop whatever you think they like. So that was one lesson. Uh, that is a, a lesson that many of these companies that implement Agile but sort of go on the negative side, is that um, you really have to think about how to embed this in the organization because often there's a long period where Agile and the more traditional way of working will be in the same environment. Uh, and the environment has been built for the more traditional approach. So um, being upfront about thinking, how will this team work? What kind of freedom will it have? But also, what kind of, how do we mitigate the risks? And how do we ensure that there's a performance mindset in there? That has been one of the biggest lessons uh, that we've learned so far. Did that answer your question? Or? The methodology itself. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, one of the first, I think I showed six, six um, requirements, and the first one was to adapt it to your local situation. Some of the elements of Agile will always be there, um, uh, but it has to fit into, into the current organization in, in the company, but also in the operating model of the, of the bank at that moment in time. Um, so, uh, so it is important to adapt and tailor the Agile approach to where you are, where you are in the journey, to the culture you have, um, and to what it is that you like to achieve with it as well, to the targets you have. Yeah? Okay. I'm sorry, she was. Oh yeah. Proxy yeah. user as a product owner, but yep. actual user. Because yep. I've seen many cases where uh, financial institutions have actually brought, brought 
Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's one of the elements that makes Agile really different, is to engage with users or consumers in an early stage. So the examples what I've seen is um, what I've seen um, Agile teams in week one or week two organize uh, consumer panels, for example. Um, but a very nice example of a bank that uh, redesigned and digitized their mortgage application process is to actually you know, these agile teams, they're co-located, right? The, the, the IT, the business people, legal compliance, they're all sit in the same room, basically. They located the room in a branch on the first floor of the branch. It happened to be available, but they were sitting in the branch so that every time one of the, one of the wireframe people made a new wireframe, wireframe, sort of a, a dummy on, a, on an iPad or, or iPhone, they would actually take the stairs down, find the customer and ask them, what do you think, you know, if you would be able to, uh, you know, apply for a mortgage this way, what do you like? And then people would say, yeah, I like it, but this button is in the wrong space or I, I wouldn't answer this question at this moment in time because it's too early, right? I'm still trying to find a mortgage that can be later. They got all sorts of useful feedback and sometimes also um, uh, counterintuitive feedback, but sometimes also uh, not consistent feedback. You know, one customer would say this, the next customer would say something else. And then, of course, you have a discussion about what is, what is it that we want to do. So it's extremely important, not just, by the way, in the beginning when you sort of design the, the new journey, uh, but particularly, you know, every sprint you do, every minimal viable product you produce, you want to show to customers. Extremely important. I'm sorry, you were first. You mentioned there are um, compliance and legal folks that are in the agile. Yeah. How comfortable were they with these kind of changes? And yeah. also, um, what is the enterprise team management process going back to, to you know, allowing these teams to, you know, obviously thrive, but also kind of remain where they yeah. So the biggest, the biggest issue with that was typically the, the senior leaders in the risk space as opposed to the risk, the risk people who were in the room. The, the risk people who were in the room and helping design, they loved it, you know. So far, uh, usually they were being asked an opinion after things were developed, you know. Somebody would put it on their desk, whether it's a legal person or a risk person, and then you were asked, sort of, what do you think? Is this possible? And so the only way to answer would be, well, it, it meets the requirements or it meets our framework or it meets the law or whatever it was, right? Or it doesn't meet the law and then it would go back. That's waterfall, right? It's a lot of waste of, of money. These guys were sitting in a room and the biggest surprise was that these people were actually the most creative, more creative than the, than the IT people and the business people. Because this is the first time somebody was asking them to actually think about what would a customer, these people are customers too, right? Um, so they came with very, um, uh, very, uh, very creative solutions. For example, um, this was a bank in South Africa where uh, for customer onboarding, uh, they were doing the customer onboarding process. And uh, in South Africa, there's a law that says you have to have a written, you know, uh, a written signature. Um, and then it was actually the legal person, actually the, the, yeah, the, the regulatory person who was sitting in the room who said, why don't we challenge that? And the rest of the team was like, what do you mean challenge that? That's the law, right? Yeah, sure. But uh, if we can prove that this is better, sorry, their process, the new process they were thinking about was to have um, people applying for a bank account to make a selfie of themselves, a, a picture of, the, uh, of their photograph in their passport, and then have biometric software you know, find out whether it's the person, right? As opposed to going to a teller and giving you a passport, and then you know, uh, that teller would have to uh, look at your passport, look at your face, and determine whether it's you. Right? Um, so they did that. They went back to the regulator. They said, you know, um, the country, it's in the interest of the country to sort of uh, embark on this digital evolution. So why don't you help us? Why don't you let us do a test? And we'll, you know, we'll set it up together with you. We'll have a test. Or this is, uh, I think, uh, 10,000 people will do uh, KYC in the old way. And this is 10,000 people will do in a new way. And then, we'll do, and then after that, we'll figure out where is more fraud, right? And of course, as everybody would predict it, uh, the biometric software is much better in recognizing whether that picture and that picture is the same person as opposed to somebody for teller, because tellers are not trained to look at somebody's you know, passport, somebody's face, and then determine whether that's you. So all to say um, this, so that, that, that was the biggest uh, um, change. These people were very creative. At the same time, the biggest issue was their bosses, because they were still living in the old world, 
in the old waterfall world where uh, you know, the head of legal was used to get a fully designed product at his or her desk and then say yes or no, as opposed to be part of the journey. So we had to spend a lot of time and the client had to spend a lot of time talking to them, but eventually uh, with the right support from senior management managed to do so. I think we have time for one more question, yes. Um, with lean, what do you mean with lean so startup principles? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so I think uh, actually Agile methodology was of course created based on many other methodologies and I think uh, they, they, they basically borrowed many aspects from different methodologies and this is I think one of them. Having, having an early minimum viable product, showing that to customers and then iterating from that in short sprints uh, comes from that methodology I think, so yes. All right. Okay, I think our time is up. Thank you very much for this morning. Have a good day.